Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. I was asking some of the children today what holiness is. What is holiness? Just think from where you're sitting right now. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. We sing, we lift up our hands, we sing, holy is the Lord. What does it mean that God is holy? Holy. It's a place we want to be. The presence of the holiness of God. I asked, who's the holiest person? <laughs> the holiest person that you know. And the way little children are so wonderful, uh, they said, Pastor Rock. <laughs> 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 they said, uh, few of them. But um, they right away they said, Jesus. Isn't that cool? I said, who is the holiest person that you know? And they didn't say, like, I didn't say, who's the holiest person that you know about? I said, who's the holiest person that you know? And Christians, we should say, Jesus, because we do know Jesus. And how are we as sinners made holy? When we're in Jesus, right? When the Holy Spirit is in us and we are in Jesus, the holiness of Almighty God is given to us, it's imputed to us, and so positionally, we are separate also. We're separate from that which is sinful, we're separate from the world, we're separate from that which is dying and condemned. We're holy in Christ, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God in us, unites us with, with our Creator. And so holiness isn't some gray-haired old man like me, you know, looking holy somehow. Holiness is, is perfect unity with our Creator, being embraced and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ that, that eliminates, removes our sin. It's a state, of, a state of peace, a state of rest. It's a state of life. It's everything good that we, every place good and everything good that we want, every place good that we want to be. It's, it's the holiness of God calls you his holy, his holy children. You have the Holy Spirit within you. That's something to celebrate today. Something to seek after and pursue, though, because we're not always holy, holy, right? We're not always entirely holy. One day we will be. Position where we are, one day, mind, soul, spirit, and body will be holy. Right now in Christ, our spirit has been made holy. It's been made alive, united with Christ in the heavenly realm. We're seated together with Christ in the heavenly places now. And one day, completely, we will be holy when we see Jesus face to face. Until then, we move in and out of the experience of holiness. And one of the reasons we come together is because when we experience holiness in our minds, in our emotions, as a result of our will and the grace of God, it's a wonderful place to be. And we try to stay there as long as we can, at least you've experienced holiness like I've experienced holiness, the experience of holiness is someplace we want to be and we want to stay. And so we're going to be talking about that a little bit more today um, through the scripture of holiness. Now, we also are drawn to the holiness of God when we hear the experiences of others. Right? Didn't the Holy Spirit give us the experience of brothers and sisters through the pages of the Bible? Um, and their life experiences that help us desire the holiness of God the way they experienced it? And when we're together in a room like this, uh, there's some of you here who might have some testimonies that can help us move towards either the desire and prayer for holiness and even, even the disciplines necessary by God's design to help us experience that holiness here and now. So do you have any testimonies from this past week? Any, uh, any expressions of this holy God that came into your life in a special way that could be an encouragement or a challenge for us? God sightings. I was reading one Jewish writer, and he was saying that um, in this life, uh, God is holy, and He transcends the world because His holiness is different than His creation. He is the Creator of all things, so He is distinct in His holiness. No one is holy like God. We can only be holy as the created created beings of a holy God. So in this world, we look for we we have God sightings. We look to see where God is interacting and in His holiness with the sinful world. Any God sightings this week that you'd like to share? Kristen, thanks. 
I've shared this in our Sunday school class with several individuals. I work in a nursing home in, in um, Staten Island that's owned by Orthodox Jewish um, people, and the administrators are Orthodox, and, and um, some of them are Hasidic, but most of them are Orthodox. Um, our administrator, his name is Aaron, he has Lou Gehrig's disease, um, and he's, he's dying in front of our faces. I mean, you know, we see him every day, but he persists to come. He can hardly speak, he can hardly move. Very intelligent, very loving man. And um, it dawned on me a couple of weeks ago that God, I've become very close to him the last um, several years he's been there and do a lot of extra special projects for him. And, and it dawns on me going to work one day, he says, oh God, that's why you put me there, because you want me to speak to him. So I'm praying for that opportunity before he dies that um, I can share clearly the um, plan of salvation with him. Because we've spoken about our faith and what we believe. And speaking to a lot of these, most of the gentlemen, um, they do love the Lord. And they're following the Lord to the best that they think that's what's going to get them. And they're waiting for the side to come. And, and they know what I believe, but we never really talk that much about it. So, but um, God's given me a challenge. And, and thankfully, as I praised him a few weeks ago, I have a staff also that are believers. So that there's a core group there that really strengthen one another. But just pray that God uses us at the right time, that we catch that opportunity and, and don't let it go so that we can share. So pray for Aaron. Um, young man, has three young children. He's only 36 years old. He probably won't live for more than another year or so. And, um, and then I have the opportunity to really share with him. Thanks, Tracy. Now, I should see some pens, unless you have much better memories than me. I should see some pens and pencils writing the name Aaron down, okay? Aaron, can you remember? How are you going to remember that? Or at least take a mental note to really be praying for Aaron. Here's, here's a man that God has placed in Chrissy's path. Chrissy is our family. She's our sister. And her heart is breaking for her co-worker. And there's an openness. Salvation doesn't smell like death to him. And there's a, a fragrance about the gospel lived out in Chrissy's life that he's attracted to. And, and uh, so please, let me see it. Who? Can I have two people who will say, I'm going to pray for Chrissy every day until Aaron gets saved or his life ends. I'm going to be praying. We've got Julie and Rosalina and Maddie. So we got three. All right? So Julie, Rosalina, and Maddie are going to remember as best you can. Put a note on your calendar, a note on your refrigerator, on your bathroom mirror. Whatever you put a note to pray for Aaron and to pray for Chrissy as, as she reaches Aaron um, with the Lord's gospel. Go ahead. Thank I'm you. not one to witness to people. I find it very difficult. But God places it to me when you least expect it. I went and bought a storm door this week in Lowe's. And when I went to pay for it, it was this young man. He's about 29. And for some reason, we got to talking. And he said he was brought up Catholic. But he's, he's, doesn't, he's tired of the Catholic Church. And he lost a friend who was 20 years old. And he gave up on God. Well, that started me, <laughs> and I read this song. And I'm not a, I'm not, I'm very shy when it comes to that. I talk a lot when no one comes to it. <laughs> and um, I told him I would tell my church about him. His name is Marcel. And I said, we will be praying for you. And I almost forgot to mention it. It was a wicked man. Uh, he was a nice young man. And he listened to me, and he didn't argue with me. And I told him I was a Christian, and my children were Christians, and and uh, that it was the greatest decision I ever made. So pray for Marcel. Marcel, don't have that down. Marcel. Let's uh, pray for Marcel, and thanks, uh, Terry, for that testimony. We talk a lot, we all talk, we use a lot of words during the way, the day. What percentage of the words come, that come out of my, my mouth are directly related to my love for God and the message that will save souls? That's, that's convicting to me as well, Terry. So thank you. Let's, let's, um, let's be talking talking about the Lord Jesus. Take the tools that we know, the scripture that alone can bring someone to salvation and, and be sharing those words with others. Um, anybody else? The holiness of God. Jeannie. Well, I'm not saying that our coaching staff is, is holy, but we try. And uh, we try to
telling the kids to boo and things like that. But on our team, that's not acceptable and it's not anything that we allow. And so the kids really know this is it. So I'm really proud of all of you. All right. And Coaches of the team are holy in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and we sure are becoming holy. It's, it's interesting, and, and as I was reading about holiness this past week and immersing myself in that wonderful, uh, wonderful subject, I was reading about the history of the quote-unquote holiness churches. Um, and among quote-unquote holiness churches, of which I have some wonderful friends who are sisters, brothers of the Lord, um, and we're part of that movement, but um, they, they said that sports had nothing to do with holiness. And in fact, when sports entered some churches as ministries, they said they were no longer holiness churches. They couldn't be holiness churches because of sports. One of the problems with us as human beings is we, we try to immerse ourselves in the holiness of, of a holy God is that we will usually, well, we tend to, to err in one of two ways. We become very legalistic about our holiness. This is what holiness looks like, right? This kind of haircut, this kind of dress, these do's and these don'ts. Um, or we can become very mystical and, and almost to the point of licentiousness where holiness is my relationship with God and whatever I feel in my heart God wants me to do, I'm going to do, um, regardless of what the teaching of the Word of God says. And so both extremes, the, the, the human desire, even in every human being, there really is a desire, a God-given desire, because we're created in His image and likeness, to, to have a relationship with God. He's placed eternity in our heart. And yes, sin has perverted that, and sin has deadened the spirit, but we still retain the image of God, even after the fall and after the flood of Noah's days, the descendants uh, who came through the flood still had the image and likeness of God. You read Genesis chapter 9. And so when we're pursuing holiness, we, we get in trouble when we separate the idea of holiness with our holy God. Right? Um, that's when we get in trouble. So in order for baseball coaches to have a holy baseball team, it's got to be WWJD. You know, what would Jesus do on first base in this situation? What would Jesus do coaching, coaching the kids? What would Jesus' heart, where would his heart be as far as the children, uh, as far as winning the game, losing the game, or reaching one of the players for his kingdom? And, and so sports and grace is not something where we separate it or we try not to separate. We're human, we don't always succeed. But it is, it's something within the context of our relationship with God. Um, so congratulations to the little Lions, our holy coaches, and our holy baseball team. They won the series. So that was really huge. Anything else? Yeah. Virginia. This is really sort of related a different way. God is holy, we know. And when he created the world, he created it perfect. And he created the animals. And I love them all. <laughs> and, um, they live in together peacefully. And then when sin came, there's such groaning in the world. But the animals, God saved them. And his holiness to me is reflected in them. Because when I saw the geese flying over and honking, that was beautiful to me. And that God put in them that instinct to fly 2,500 miles or 6,000 miles and then come back. And I just love the holiness of God through his creation. Something else. Go ahead, Chrissy. Share it. Share it. Um, I have a good friend of mine. Her name is Ann Chen. Her daughter lives in China. They were separated for 17 years until she get all the paperwork for her daughter to come. I make this brief. She came over a year, about a year ago, the, the year at the end of June. She became a Christian when she's here. She takes English, English, class, English classes at a church, and she decided to go back to China. Wow. She gave up the privilege of being here in America. She could have stayed, and her mother's heart broken. But she felt compelled to now go back to her homeland to share what she believes. Nice. I mean, I, you know, so I'm praying for her. Her, her name is Nana. 
bigger the cat, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now Mal so, yeah. yeah. is the daughter and yeah. the mother is Anne. Yeah. Anne and Shen. Now, in reading about holiness, I was reading about times in, in different places in history where God was moving among the masses of people by his grace. And many, many people, I mean whole cities, 10,000 people in Rochester, New York, and, and other places where where people responded to the true message of the gospel and in a way that when I used to read about it, I said, this is amazing. Was this, a, was this like mass um, uh, hypnotism? What was going on here? Was it really the act of God? What's the fruit that we see from these times of revival? You know, within the Chinese community right now, a type of revival is like that. There's a sense, as I read about it in history, there are times where by God's grace, there is a sense of the holiness of God which for unbelievers is terror, okay? It's fear. It's fear of impending doom and judgment of, of the anger and the wrath of God. It's, it's, a, it's a heavy sense that's almost physical. And when that spirit comes upon a region, which it has, at least in my understanding, different types of history, it is that time when those who are men and women who know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ the message is effective in, in such an amazing way. Uh, the message is always effective, but the message is effective because God is preparing the hearts to receive it, the soil for the seed of the gospel to go into. And that's what's happened among the Chinese community, particularly the Fujinese, but also many other Chinese um, subcultural groups right now. Um, and, and that's why we need to be praying for Pastor Ding and our other Chinese uh, brothers and sisters in Christ because they are living among a people that are under the conviction of a holy God. And the way their plan of evangelism, I've shared it before, but in their main church building in Manhattan, which is very well known, Grace Church to the Fujinese, is a well known as a landmark right now because it's the only Protestant church among the Fujinese people in New York City in Manhattan. And this is the second one. There's one in Philadelphia. They're all related. But all they do is they get to the office early and they stay all day and all day people come in and they say, Pastor, what can I do? My heart is breaking. I need to know this Jesus. And they cry and they pray and, and they, they wrestle with God. They hear the scripture until they have peace in their heart through faith in Jesus Christ. And um, if you read about some of the missionaries who went to China, William Carey and others, you can see they were praying. They were men and women who dedicated their lives. And they didn't see much fruit at the time when they were there. Many of them. But it was through their prayers and through their holiness that I believe now we're seeing a revival like this. And when I go with Pastor Thing, you know what I say to him? We're praying. Any way we can help, we'll help. But please pray for, pray for the other people in Sunset Park. Pray that the same powerful spirit of conviction of God's holiness would fall upon all of us, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, and that there would be a revival that comes from the spirit of God that works itself out according to the word of God. Anytime you study revivals, there's usually excesses and there are all kinds of spin-offs that have nothing to do with the word of God. And that's why we pray for true holiness. You cannot separate holiness from the person of God or you get in big trouble. And never can we separate holiness from the Word of God because otherwise we create our own sense of, of holiness that really has nothing to do with, with the nature and the character of God. So we'll continue to pray for the revival among the Chinese. From the Fujinese, it is going back into China. The Fukan province is one of the largest provinces in China, directly across from Taiwan. And um, I think it was Newsweek or New York Times article I was reading two weeks ago, said that the whole culture of that province is being turned upside down. Every single level of government, from the communists, the highest levels of the communist government, to every business, is completely being immersed in evangelical Christianity. And the Chinese government does not have a plan to handle this. This was not on their political agenda to modernize China. So um, God is working in a very powerful way um, in China right now. So let's keep Aunt Chen, who's going back to China, as a missionary in our prayers. And praise God that she came here and found the Lord. Now she's going back. That, that's, that's awesome. Share your stories with each other. 
All right, encourage one another to live holy lives um, during our times of fellowship. Um, it's Rosalina Trompeta's birthday tomorrow. And uh, yes, and, uh, let's, um, let's keep Rosalina and Zardo in our prayers. Um, happy birthday, Rosalina. I hope you have a wonderful birthday and a wonderful blessed year. You've been such a great blessing to us. And thank you. It's a Filipino tradition that I learned, at least since I've been here, that usually Filipinos on their birthday invite other people out to eat when it's their birthday. Now, I'm not putting Rosalina on the spot. But I'd like to say, what Rosalina, what you have done is on your birthday, we celebrate the gift that you are to the whole church. You don't need to take this out. You're just a wonderful gift, and we love you, and uh, thank you. Birthday today, so we will be tuning here also. Two of our two of our meetings since their birthday. Thank you. Thank you.